We have a lot to do today, and we started last, we ended last week rather, by posing a question about curses. And the curses were this. In Genesis chapter 3, there are curses. There are curses laid out. Let's just go ahead and read them, and then we're going to ask the question with which we ended last week. We're not going to read the whole section, but Genesis chapter 3, let's start at what God said to the woman in verse 13. God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. There's also a curse given to the man, and we're not picking on the women here, but we are rather, instead, we are taking a look at how we read our Bible. And that is so desperately important when it comes to the subject of women, because very early on in the Bible, it looks like God has put a curse on man and woman, and the specifics of that curse we need to talk about today. Sin has consequences. Did Jesus come to enforce and underline curses? Or did Jesus come to break the curses? Now, as we said last week, I believe that the answer to this is an obvious one. And that is he came to break the curses. But you might not be terribly surprised at this point to find out that that's a minority position when you come directly into the lane of women and ministry and church and kingdom. Almost every minister I know of, and most Christians would have said, he came to break the curses. But then you start looking at the details, and they start pulling back because of what they've been told. Not because of what the scripture actually says. We ended last week also with a couple of very troubling quotes. I don't know if you remember the quotes or not. I remember them all the time. A very low opinion of women by some of, by no means all, some of the early church leaders, not terribly early, but we're looking at about 150 and beyond, especially around the year 200, where they would look at a woman that dared to question them and said, don't you know that you are an Eve? You are the bringer of death. You are the, oh my that's nothing new. For a very long time, since the seven, eight hundreds with Muslims, and before that with the Jews, men have a prayer that they prayed every day. The Jews have actually pretty much stopped saying the prayer. Uh, the Muslims have not. But it, in both of the prayers, they have a line thanking God that they were not made a woman. Christian leaders often grabbed onto Genesis chapter 3 and joined it with 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, wherein we were, go- we're going to take some good looks at 1 Timothy today, but we will look at other verses as well. And they grabbed the tail end of these two passages in Scripture, most often used to silence women and to limit their participation in public life and in church life. Now, let me explain public life. What you may or may not be aware of is that many church leaders believe that not only should women not lead in churches, but they should not lead in public. They should not be in charge of a man at all, in business, in politics, anywhere. One of those men, if you are in Tennessee, or if you're in the United States, you have probably heard of the man, David Lipscomb, for whom a wonderful university right up the road in Nashville is named. He believed that women could not ever be in charge of any man, period, whether in schools or in uh, politics or in business, and certainly not in the church. And he grabbed that from 1 Timothy chapter 2. They believed that women were only good for serving the men and being his helpmeet and raising children. They went to Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, that gives directions to young and old men and young and old women, and took the line that women were to keep the home They changed it basically to keep at home. I'll never forget when we moved to America and my wife got a job at a travel agency. 
that we even got a letter from one of the members of our church to her how disappointed they were that she had taken employment outside the home. Not as unusual as you might think, but more and more of us are probably getting past that, but yet still, still. Let me tell you how bad this gets, and this gets pretty bad. When doctors found that they could greatly lessen the pain of childbirth by using anesthesia or some other medications, most doctors, until nearly World War II, refused to use them on women. I'd say about half were doing it in the early decades of the 1900s. The other half refused to. You know why? They didn't want to interfere with God's judgment on women. Women, God said, would have great pain in childbirth. Who are they to thwart the will of God by giving women anesthesia? Well, one of the first things I think of in this is you've misinterpreted Scripture. Second is you don't know how to read Scripture. Third is you've never given birth. I think giving birth might help you reread scripture. But you know, there are women who have written books that it is sinful for women to take pain control during childbirth. And every time that I speak of women taking a greater role, I find I get more kickback from women than men. It's quite the surprise. We like our lanes. These doctors believed, as many people do to this very day, that women are still bearing the curse of Eve and that the sins of Eve are upon them and that they bear guilt in bringing these in. In fact, by the way, just to let you know how ignorant things can be, uh, no matter what our science is, we don't know what we don't know. All the way up until the early 1800s, it was thought that women contributed nothing to the birth but incubation that the little sperm was enti the entire individual. And therefore, if a woman was barren, it was always the woman's fault, because a man did his job. Until there was a, a big fight that went on, actually since 1677, if you want to get pedantic, but mainly in the 1700s, between the spermatist and the ovist, and I am not making those terms up, before they finally decided that the women did contribute something to the human race other than incubation. Sadly, many did not use science to come to their conclusions. They went to the curse and they said, how can we come from Eve who brought sin into the world? They used the Bible as an excuse to denigrate women. The attitude was very, very deep, is very, very deep. In fact, in many societies and, and in our language, doctors and scientists agreed with the church that women were not capable of rational thought under pressure, that they were more emotional, more subject to mental breakdown. Let me be very clear here. Men and women do have very, very great differences physiologically and psychologically. Their brains are different. Women do, as a rule, have more ability to nurture, multitask, raise children, and keep them alive than men do. Men are more narrow-minded in that they, I call it the see the bear, kill the bear mentality. They don't actually think about all the ramifications that women do. They have, and this is why putting them together is a really good idea, because that way they get all the different angles. While we are different, not, not one of us is not, is not the other sex. It's just, there's no lesser. There are two equals before God. But it was so ingrained in science and in the church and in society that when anatomy was finally allowed to be studied inside, which once again really did not happen in the West, except for a few isolated incidences. You were allowed to dissect the corpses, for example, of, uh, of condemned and killed criminals. But when they started checking out women, they found women had different body parts. And they named part of their body after they thought this must be what causes women to be irrational and unable to lead. And so when they remove that part of the body, they call it a hysterectomy because it removes what causes hysteria. Yeah. That wasn't that long ago. That was not that long ago. And to this day, many studies have been done 
In fact, there was a book written by Dr. Robert Mendelson back in the 1980s called Male Practice. Many studies have been done since then and before then that show that women do not get as much treatment as men do when we, they go into the doctor. Uh, I, I believe one, I've told my wife, it's your fault because you get pretty before you go in. <laughs> men get up, they're stinky, their hair's everywhere, they're coughing, they're wiping their nose on their arm. They walk in, they say, I'm dying. Women get all pretty, go in, and the doctor says, how are you? And she goes, I'm fine. Don't do that. That's one thing you could stop. And again, I'm, I'm playing to stereotypes there. The underlying real issue is that male doctors tend, and some female doctors tend to take women less seriously when they speak of pain, emotional difficulties, and they, intend, they, they tend to medicate emotions faster without looking for cause. That is still true to this very day. In other words, the church's attitude toward women permeated society and still does, even in societies that consider themselves more progressive. Let me give you another illustration. You're not going to like this one. I don't like it. Martin Luther, hero of the Reformation, whose name is on churches that I drive by every day, and those churches do not hold to what he said. I need to stress that. Martin Luther said about the pain and stress that women go through during childbirth. If women become tired, even die, it does not matter. Let them die in childbirth. That is what they're there for. He was married. He was married, and she didn't kill him. Uh, how can someone be so cold and callous toward one of God's children? Because he took 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 out of context. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. He would have told you here that the Bible is very plain here. It could not be plainer. And if we want to take, by the way, and go back up to verse 11 and 12 and take that literally, why would we not take 15 literally? That's what he would say and did say in his writings. We've told you before, sometimes you need to take a context. Sometimes you need to know what's going on. And you need to know why something was said. I don't think Paul was saying what we think he's saying. We need more information. We need more context. We need Ezekiel 18. And by the way, mad props to Mary Grant for reading it because that's not an easy passage to read. And Ezekiel, you've got to know Ezekiel. I know Ezekiel is a madhouse to read. It really is. But there are many blessings within it. And one of them is Ezekiel 18 verses 14 through 22. Because God could not have made it more plainer through Ezekiel. Who was speaking to people who were in captivity because of what their parents did. And he said every person is guilty only of their own sins. Not the sins of their fathers. Not the sins of their ancestors. And he, he really makes that as plain as absolutely possible. So how can women bear the guilt and consequences of sin because of something which Eve did in the garden? They don't. Because Jesus. By the way, men don't bear the consequences of Adam's sin because of Jesus. Remember in 1 Timothy, Eve, uh, Paul says that Eve was the first to be deceived. And I have read so many books from the uh, complementarian perspective. That means men have their roles, women have their roles, men just happen to have the good ones. And they will almost without exception use Paul saying there that she was deceived first, therefore sin came through her, and he put it in the order of creation you know, that uh, she was made second, he was made first. So the order of creation nails this. But we mentioned before that in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, Paul says that all sin came through Adam. Oh, by the way, we mention 1 Corinthians 14 a lot, don't we? We'll mention it more in the weeks ahead. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 21 and 22, one chapter over, not even a whole chapter. He says, sin came through Adam, all death came through Adam. 
So did he forget what he wrote one chapter ago? You're really going to love or hate part 10. That's all I'm going to tell you about, uh, about that particular passage. But the answer is no. He doesn't forget what he wrote. He's making different points in different ways. And we have conflated his points to mean so much more than they ever did. Let's just, uh, let's just go through this. Even in the chapter before the one we're looking at in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 13 through 16. A beautiful passage Paul talks about forgiveness from sin. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy that in me, the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Isn't that an amazingly beautiful passage? Full of hope. Full of amazing hope. And did you notice what wasn't there? It's something which... I was born with, and I don't know whether it's a blessing or a curse. But when I read things, I see what's there, but I also see what is not there. In this beautiful treatise, he never once mentions being forgiven of Adam's sin. Because he doesn't need to be. And women, you don't need to be forgiven of Eve's sin. It's time we pulled back for a moment. Take a deep breath. And talk once again about multivocality. We brought up that word. You've learned that word. The fact that the Bible speaks in multiple voices, not all of which agree with each other. That's why we're told to rightly divide or handle correctly the scripture. Even the plainest statements of scripture, when removed from their cultural, linguistic, historical context, become pretext. Text without context is pretext. And if we arrogantly speak of just reading and believing and deny that we're also interpreting, it is impossible to read without interpreting. Impossible. I'm old enough to remember when we got our first color telly, television. For those of you that demand more syllables, uh, we got our first telly that was color. And I thought they got it wrong. We'd been watching monochrome for so long that I'd already colored it in, in my head. And so when they showed the color, I was going, well, that's not the color of his eyes. That's not the color of that. It took a long time for me to find, I kept going up and adjusting. Kids, back in the day, adjusting your television was a constant thing. I don't want to get into it. It was a horrible time. Dinosaurs rolled the earth. It was a horrible time. Yeah, we are, we are blessed now. But I can remember I couldn't grasp because I had already written the story and the colors in my head. Well, we overlay our perceptions on everything. I've read books before that uh, mysteries or thrillers. That's what I do to kind of give my brain a break. And then somebody will do a movie or a television show and I'll say that's not what they look like. Because I've already done it. We recently watched a long TV series about a detective, and so I read one of the books in the series, and it helped immensely because I already knew what pictures to put in. With the Bible, you don't know what pictures to put in because you haven't seen the show. You weren't there. You weren't on the ground. You didn't hear the language. You didn't know the cultural context. You don't know what was happening to these people, what they went through on the way to and back from the synagogue, and then to gather with their house churches alike. We don't know. Instead, however, we ignore all that. We put our interpretations on there and we say the Bible plainly says and we divide again and again and again and again. We've already looked at the context of 1 Timothy 2, but let's review. In verse 2, do you pray for kings and all those in authority? Well, some will say, well, every now and then I slip in a prayer for the leader if I like him. No, that's not what he said. 
And do you pray for President Trump and his family? Do you pray for President Biden, who's plainly going through his own issues and their family? Do you pray for King Charles, who has cancer and whose daughter-in-law does as well? Do you pray for them? Do you pray for France, which right now, after an election, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. When you have three different parties and each has a third, what happens? Do you pray for these people? I don't, I'm not saying you need to know all the names because of me, people, when we get to you know, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and all those, I couldn't even pronounce the names. But the whole concept of praying for leaders, do we do that? We're supposed to, but that's, that's the easy one. The last bit of that verse, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. The phrase peaceful and, and quiet comes from one word. And we see that word again in this chapter. But it's not translated peaceful and quiet. It's called quietness and submission. It's the same word. Something's very wrong here. Lay aside for a moment just how that happened, although we'll talk a little bit about it when we, did, we talk about who killed Junia, a name and someone looked upon highly among the apostles that most of us don't know about. We're going to talk about that in a sermon too. But let's lay aside for exactly how this happened and realize that the word here, peaceful and quiet, is not a volume word so much as it is an attitude word. It isn't calling for silence. It's calling for a particular attitude. I have seen in many men's meetings or business meetings or elder meetings or church boards, men absolutely violating the peaceful and quiet. But because they're men, they think they have that role. No, you don't. No, you don't. We've all been called to the same. Adam and Eve's kids have all been called to the same standard. How about in verse 8? Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. <laughs> there goes Twitter. <laughs> Do you believe that people have to pray with their men? Men have to pray. Let's just say men, even though the word there refers to everyone. Let's just say men. Do you think we have to raise our hands to pray? Or do you think it's a concept? It's an idea in their society. They understood it. I've heard it used all my life. That that's metaphorical. That in other words, our hands should be holy and not doing evil. And I'm going, why is that metaphorical and the rest of the chapter isn't? How can you do this? Is, this a ca is the Bible a cafeteria line where you can just go through and say, I'll take that. I'm not going to take that. I'm going to take that. I'm not going to take that. Or do you have to take everything in context? So don't get the mashed potatoes without the gravy. Don't get the beets, period. Don't, listen, it's purple radioactive juice that kills everything on the plate. There's a sign from God. I think you should pay attention. You, you go through, uh, by the way, in Scotland, beets are considered a treat. And you'll hear people say, if you don't eat your meat, you'll not get your beets. And I'm going, deal, <laughs> deal, I'm in. Anyway, how about, how about verse 9? I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Are women allowed to fix their hair? Women allowed to have jewelry? There are Christian religions that say no. They're wrong. His point was, don't let the outer be what you're most concerned about. Dress the inner and let it reflect on the outer. And yet what we did was we took a, a phrase that was, had deep meaning, especially in their context, because Timothy is in Ephesus, not to give too much away. Ephesus, a female-dominated city under Artemis or Diana, same God. Artemis was a female name at the time. They taught that women were formed first. The first God was a female, that men were second class and obviously faulty. And as a result of this really bizarre set of wars and God's eating wars and God's eating gods and things happening to them. And all this great, long, endless genealogies and myths that Paul talks about, he's addressing here. We don't get that because we don't live in Ephesus 
2,000 years ago. And therefore, we're taking instructions about how to look like Christ in that society and trying to apply it in Chapala, Mexico, in Anacortes, Washington, Miami, Florida, and Nashville, Tennessee. There's something very wrong with doing that. When I was a boy, the preachers used to preach against mixed bathing, which doesn't mean what you think it does. I found that out. I'd never heard of the concept of swimming together with young ladies because I was raised in a house that was so strict that had never been an option. And besides, we usually lived places where the water was so cold, nobody went in there on purpose. But I did notice in America that the further away you got from the ocean, the more they preached against mixed bathing or swimming. The closer you got to the ocean, eh, you know something? That didn't bother me at all. Because if it's super hot and you're still being modest, hop in the water. That's fine. Yeah, what's modest in one place may not be modest in another. That's absolutely true. If you go to Japan today, a modern society, ladies, they will ask you not to show your shoulders. Because there, that's still not acceptable. Uh, they'll ask you, men and women, if you laugh, to put your hand up over your face because big emotions are not acceptable, which is really weird if you've ever watched a Japanese movie. I'm just going, I see one. Um, but again, if I go to Japan, guess what? I'm going to follow the rules because that's their culture. But I'm not going to take their culture and put it on every other culture every other time in history. Paul isn't trying to tell them how to get to heaven. They're going to heaven. He's just telling them how to act more like Christ while they're here. And in their situation, this was their situation. But now we get to the big one. Verse 15. I already read it. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. So let me ask those complementarians out there that believe women have lesser roles. What saves a woman? Is it faith in God through Christ, not that of herself, but a gift given to her by the Spirit? Is it baptism? Um, is it giving her body to be burned? I mean, what, what saves a woman? If you run to Acts 2.38 and I run here, which verse is going to win? You can't use the Bible like this because we're talking about different voices in different situations. But people do. Are barren women therefore unable to be saved regardless of their desire to have children or not? Regardless of their baptism, regardless of their love of God, regardless of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, are they unable to go to heaven because they haven't born a child? I will grant you, I've never heard anybody make that point, but they may as well because they take the rest of the chapter literally when it fits them and when it works for them. This is obviously not a blanket principle for churches in all nations throughout all time. Or Paul wouldn't in 1 Corinthians tell people, I wish you'd remain single like I am. When he looks about the, the coming persecution. And knowing it's going to be more difficult if you've got a family. He says, I wish you'd remain single. Well, what about being saved through childbirth? He's not talking about that. He's talking about something they would understand. In Ephesus, women were encouraged not to give children and abort or kill the babies they had. So he's saying, be so unlike the pagans that you treasure the children. Even if the world throws you away, you don't throw away the child. By the way, America, there's a lesson there for us about the life and value of life. We can do the same kind of work in 1 Corinthians, by the way. Look in chapter 11 and just ask yourself after, are women allowed to pray without their head covered? I've been in churches where they couldn't, where immediately the women put up, and others where they arrived pre-covered with a, I don't know the name for it, and I don't mean to be disrespected. It looks like a doily, a little lace cutout that's just pinned to the top of their head, you know, which I'm thinking, well, that thing's kind of transparent. I don't know what kind of a covering it is, but I was not an easy child to raise. That's a shocker. Um, what about Paul? And he says, pray without ceasing. Can they ever take it off? I've had students whenever I teach up at Ohio State or other places that are Jewish men that wear a little cap. 
Does that bother me? No. First Corinthians says, praying with your head uncovered. He's not talking about hair and head. And in fact, he even makes a point in there. We have no such tradition like this among the churches. And people don't ever read that verse. But they will read, when I was growing up in the 60s, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And in fact, he uses the same word shame that he later uses for homosexual attacks upon others. Not consensual relationships, but brutal attacks. He uses shame. And he uses it for long hair. Do you think, do you think long hair is a sin? Or was there something going on in Corinth he was trying to, to address and he used hair as an illustration? By the way, it's B. Spoiler alert. I'm like that. I walk in and my grandson, the youngest one, is watching Bob the Builder and they're singing, Can He Build It? And I'm going, spoiler alert. Yes, he can. <laughs> I'm not usually allowed to comment during movies or TV shows anymore. What about the call for... Um, Oh, I want to go on, but I'm getting near the end of my time and not near the end of my notes. So let me say this. What about his condemnation of women with short hair in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians? What about our dear sisters who have had cancer and lost their hair? Or alopecia, the condition in which your hair falls out. What about, is that, what is that saying about them? Is it a shame? No. But we do know that throughout history, when men wanted to shame women, they shaved their heads for a variety of reasons. A good friend of mine, an artist in Colorado Springs, was born to a woman who was misused by the Nazis and yet called a collaborator after France was free. And I can only imagine what happened to his mama. Uh, this is what men have done to women. And he's using these illustrations to talk really about Christ and family and such. And people get it all wrong. But questions like this have to be asked because they plainly point out that there are rocks in the stream that don't fit with the rest of the stream. And if we take them as written, we have to explain away and invalidate scores of other passages. We're going to deal with these rocks. We're going to continue to deal with these rocks. But in the meantime, remember what Paul also said in 1 Corinthians, the chapter before verse, uh, chapter 14 rather. In chapter 13, he says that three things remain. Faith, hope, and what? Love. This house church got it. But do you understand what you said, what he said next when he said the greatest of these is love, which means love even trumps faith and hope. There are times my faith is shaky and there are times where something happens on the news or in my life and my hope hits a rock. Love is what we have to pull us through. And what happens if our love is failing? Oh, it's not our love that pulls us through. It's the love of Christ. And remember what, we, what he said. We're, we're going to do this out of 1 Corinthians and then We'll, we'll end my part today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, probably should have pre-turned there. A professional would have done that. What we've received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Verses 1 and 2. I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Going to chapter 15, but while I turn there, I would submit to you that nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified is what you need to hold on to. The rest of this is just helpful instructions to people in different cultures about how to do that. But as he wraps up this chapter, uh, or I'm sorry, this book, one chapter after the infamous 1 Corinthians 14. For what I received, I passed on to you of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. 
Then he appeared to James and all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. That's of first importance. That's what we hold on to. We don't make anything else more important than that. We do not say, as I have seen on Twitter again this week, you are not a Christian if, and one of these other passages is quoted. No, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishnet. Jesus said, when it comes in, it has all kinds of creatures that live in the sea in it. And the angels come and do the sorting. You're just a fish. Fish don't get to sort. Remember of first importance. Yes, he broke the curse. Love will carry us through. Look to Jesus.